Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Euro Nurse. I'm your host, Vic Sinise, and we meet every Saturday at 9 a.m. Central Time. If you're watching this on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, welcome to the show. And hey, you YouTube subscribers, doing a great job out there. We're so close to 300 subscribers, 297 this morning. So hey, keep subscribing to their show. This is your first time watching us. Be sure to check us out on Euronurse.com. Best place to go to learn more about the show. It's also the best place to go to watch all of our past episodes. We have 59 of them in the hopper for you. Also, if you want to watch or want to listen to the show on, in your car, check out our audio podcast. Go to our nurse, Euro Nurse Plus area, and you can pick any one of your favorite uh, podcasting platforms to listen to our show. We'd like to welcome a new sponsor from last week's show. Elatone is now sponsoring the show. Remember, you can always get to our website to get to their websites by clicking on their logo. It'll take you right to their website. And hey, if you're uh, not getting our newsletter and you want to get it, go ahead and subscribe. It's on our website. Also, during the show, no matter how you're watching us, any questions, just put them in our comment box. We'll be glad to read off your question. Um, be a part of the show. This week, got a great show. It's going to be talking about your dynamics. We have the folks from Gemini who are a sponsor of the show too. And they're going to be talking about some your dynamic information and some information about their equipment. So let's go ahead and bring in our experts right now. Hey, experts, welcome to the show. Morning. Hey. Hey, everybody. All right. So as our usual, I'm going to kick off with our intro and our interesting facts or favorite story. So I've got uh, mine ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and click into mine here. So here's a picture of my mom and dad. So uh, interesting fact, my mom was a nurse or was a nurse. My dad was an x-ray technician. And I'm curious out there, you can put this in the, the comments section, what kind of influence your family had. So, you know, it's, for instance, was your mom or dad in the healthcare field? Um, I'm the oldest of five children too. And I have two brothers, two sisters out of the five of us, three of us are nurses. So I guess it was kind of a predestined being a part of that group. Anyway, put it in the comments. Could be fun to find out where we, whether you have healthcare folks in your family. All right, let's bring in our panelists to go over their intros. Go ahead, Andrea. Good morning. My name is Andrea Strong. I'm a nurse practitioner in Wisconsin. I've been working in urology since 2010. I was a nurse for a long time. I've done inpatient. I've done outpatient. I'm also certified as a urologic registered nurse, and I'm the educational director for the Chicago Metro chapter of SUNA. And Vic, to answer your question, yes, my mom worked in healthcare. She was a secretary in a hospital. She's retired now. She was the person who printed your wristbands, put those on, and got you registered. And she really encouraged me to be a nurse. And I'm very fortunate that she did because I love what I do. Great, great to see. And Lori, go ahead with your introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Atkinson. I'm a certified urology registered nurse. Um, I've been in urology for 25 years now, and I currently work for Northwestern Medicine in Geneva and Winfield. Um, last year, I, our last show, I shared that I have five kids. Well, speaking of the medical um, part of this, I have a veterinarian. My oldest, the oldest is a veterinarian, and my fifth child is actually going to school for forensic science. So with that said, when I get old, I have somebody to take care of me, either a veterinarian or a forensic scientist. <laughs> hey, that's really great. Great story. John, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello. Lori, just hope you don't have any enemies, right? For instance, <laughs> forensic scientists that need to... Uh utilize their services. Hello, everyone. I'm a private practice urologist in Gilbert, Arizona, who is paying it forward by sharing my experience in the business and clinical aspects of medicine to benefit all of my colleagues. And one of the ways that I'm doing so is by creating the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. We're currently close to 2,400 U.S.-based urology practice folks collaborate to improve our practices, and it's all for free. As far as whether or not there's anyone in my family in medicine, no, no one's, no one's in medicine in my family. And it's the typical Asian thing where my parents pushed me into 
medicine. Of course, I said no. Yeah, just like they encouraged me to date someone Asian. No, never dated anyone Asian. Never, never did that. So initially, I fought them. And what I did, it's an interesting fact, is that I used to work in a CPA firm and said entertainment business management CPA firm in Beverly Hills, California, where we manage back in the 90s, hair bands and glam rock bands. Mm-hmm. Warrant was one of those. And uh, I watched a lot of tours, uh, a lot of uh, concerts when they would go on tour and perform. So that was very interesting. And, and, and then I realized, well, I could always do something easier, like being a working in entertainment business management. I wanted to have no regrets in life. So I said, I'm going to try the hardest, finally following the recommendations of my parents and pursue medicine. And that's what led me to where I am. So no one in, in, the, in the family is in medicine. You were a real rebel. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. And from Gemini, we have two speakers today. Uh, I'm going to have Elizabeth uh, Babin uh, give her introduction for us. Good morning. Bye. Good morning. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Babin. Um, I am a practicing neurogynecologist in South Florida, and I'm a co-founder for Gemini Medical Technologies, um, which is what we're going to be talking to you about this morning. I um, come from a background of um, several different types of practice, private practice, into academic medicine, of which I was a professor at the University of Kansas, and then also at um, Drexel University prior to coming to South Florida, where I am the director for um, a pelvic health center here. Um, As far as family members with a background in medicine, I can thank my grandmother, who was a licensed vocational nurse, an LVN. Um, She had a two-year associate's degree. And um, she would, when my sister and I were very young, she would bring us into the nursing home where she worked. And we would visit with um, the elderly patients and make rounds and do entertainments and sing with them. And that is really where I got my passion for medicine and how I came into this field. Hey, great. Really appreciate that. And last but not least, Brian, go ahead and give us your introduction. Good morning. I'm Brian Hirsch. Um, Thank you to the audience, the panels. Dr. Lynn, nice to see you again. Um, I'm a co-founder as well and general manager for Gemini. I've been in management in the aerodynamic space for about 15 years now in different companies. Um, I was thinking about my interesting fact for you, and that was that um, for two different, um, not military-based, but job-based roles, I had to go overseas for two years, one year on each tour. And in thinking back about it, I was in Munich, Germany for a year, and I was in Netherlands for a year. Never learned either language. And when I was in Munich, I used to go to the barber shop, and they would say service when I walked in, and a barber would come out and cut my hair. And I thought that meant, you know, Someone needed service. And on my last week living in Munich, we were at a restaurant and in light bulbs was the word service across a wall of the restaurant. And I said to my friend, what does that mean? And it turned out it was Bavarian uh, German slang for hello, hey, what's up? So they were actually greeting me every time. And I thought they were calling for someone to come out and give me service. And then on my second tour, I uh, was getting on the plane to fly back to the United States. It was over and I started on my phone typing up every place I had been. And it was pretty interesting. I'd been in 13 countries and 35 cities in that nine month period, um, not including all the little small towns you drive through. So that's my interesting fact. Wow. That's great. All righty. We're ready to get rolling on the show. So let's bring in our slides. Hey, Vic, I just wanted to share, Katie had mentioned, Katie Bortel, she mentioned that her dad was a medic during World War II. That's cool. Hey, see, I I thought there was a connection out there. Oh, that's great. And I forgot to mention as well that my uncle on my father's side was also a pediatrician. So we do have a little medicine in our family as well. You know, it always makes for interesting talk around the the dinner table. (laughs) And I have to say, (laughs) the nursing talks were more interesting than the radiology ones. So (laughs) not surprised I went into nursing. All right, Brian, take it away. So we're, we're going to talk today about your dynamics and the changing, how it's changing uh, with the challenges in the medical environment. And, and more specifically, we know that there's been your dynamics on your nurse before. So we wanted to come to it from a slightly different angle. We wanted to look at the past, what's been happening in the most recent years, kind of current state-ish, but and the future, which is already starting to happen then. And that includes um, service, that includes new technologies such as what Gemini has. 
Then Dr. Babin's gonna talk about uh, two clinical cases to kind of talk about how to use new technology. And then I'm going to assist with, like Dr. Lin is always talking about that, how to do uh, medicine while improving the bottom line and then changing healthcare. And then we'll go into a Q&A session. So globally, the medical environment is in a constant flux. Um, it, you know, from a business and a patient care perspective. So if you think about business, If you think about business, um, you have declining reimbursements. We have an ever-increasing overhead. The, the complications with insurance billing is outrageous. It's the most confusing service-oriented billing procedures that I've ever experienced. And insurance approvals and authorizations are getting harder. They're coming up with more excuses as why to not cover something. Um, we have increasing government regulations. And then we have outrageous medical malpractice costs. Um, on the flip side of that, you know, we want to give and provide patient care, but we run into a lot of different challenges and COVID in particular provided a lot of challenges that we weren't expecting. You know, there was the risk of coming to the office and having exposures that we hadn't really thought about at the time. There were personnel challenges. We couldn't find people to work. The healthcare profession was under a lot of stress and strain. People were retiring and quitting. I don't know about in your communities, but in our community, we lost a lot of OBGYNs. We lost a lot of urologists who just said they couldn't handle all the challenges that were coming from the business aspect, from I'm putting my life on the line, and they just quit or retired. So we have shortages not only from you know professional, the, the urologists and the docs, but we also have shortages in just our service nurses and the medical assistants. Um, and then we had different challenges that I hadn't really thought about coming in after COVID. The grads were coming in having not experienced any clinical training. They were doing Zoom meetings and Zoom education. And I just found, I find it very interesting now when they're coming into the practice as a new grad, they're a whole different level where they need the clinical training on the spot in the practice. We learned the realities of supply chain shortages and just overall, I think there's been a greater focus on dollars and maybe even to the detriment some of patient care. We have greater risk of malpractice claims, especially here in the United States, and we're lacking in innovation. I mean, the, the cooperation between industry and medicine has changed over the time that I've been in practice significantly. And you know, those kind of interactions between the physician and industry were really a driving force for what made the United States a great place and, you know, the primary place for everyone across the world to seek medical care. And, you know, we want to see some of that innovation and that lack of innovation is bringing some of this challenge to the medical environment. We're seeing a movement from physician owned and guided practices to more of a hospital owned or a private equity business model. Um, and I think that it brings in and about its own challenges and, and, you know, physicians in general have gone into practice because they want to, they have a, a, they have a business spirit many of the time, but they're running into so many challenges, they can't wear both hats. So that's, I think, why we're seeing this transition into hospital and private equity on business models. Next slide. So how can your dynamics help? You know, it is in in our practice, urology and urogynecology practice, it is, is the, one of the most reliable revenue streams. It has a very high reimbursement. It has excellent RVU support for those employed physicians. Um, and it's performed by, by physicians super, under su supervision by the physician, meaning that the medical assistant, nurse, nurse practitioner, or the resident can perform the procedure rather than doing specifically by the physician the physician then interprets the study and that revenue is counted towards their um, bottom line. We also notice that coverage is pretty universal. It's very rare from Medicare to private health insurance that as long as you're using proper coding, your dynamics is very well covered. The International Continent Society, the American Urology Association and the American Urogynecology Societies all recommend that before planning some type of an invasive therapy that you could, should consider doing urodynamics. I think it's well tolerated by our patients and it's a reliable diagnostic tool. You know, it assists us in guiding therapeutic intervention. 
in complicated cases where someone hasn't responded to traditional therapies. For example, they have both overactive and stress incontinence, or maybe they don't even know they have stress incontinence. You know, they don't experience leakage when they cough or sneeze. They're elderly, they don't move around much, but they'll come into the practice and they've tried multiple medications and nothing has worked for them. And then we find that they have intrinsic sphincter deficiency and that in order to address any bladder spasms that are occurring, you may need to address the weakness of that sphincter. It can be used in patient counseling regarding outcome potentials. So in a patient who has mixed urinary incontinence, just as one example, um, you know, those patients have a very good chance with doing a sling procedure for their stress incontinence. About half the time, the overactive bladder will kind of calm down and get better as well because you have a little more resistance to any kind of a bladder spasm. But there is some published data that shows that in neurodynamic studies, if you see a bladder pressure over 20 during a contraction of, of intrusor overactivity, that those patients may not be cured of their overactive bladder, and that would help you counsel them. You're likely going to continue to experience an overactive bladder, come back to the office, and we'll be able to address that. If we're lucky, hey, it gets better, but you know, it gives us an ability to counsel them about um, potential risks. Another example might be for stress incontinence, where um, you're going to go into the operating room to do a sling, but you notice on your urodynamic study that they, they have a lot of valsalva voiding, so they're bearing down pushing very hard. If you do that, when you have a sling in place, you're going to meet a lot of resistance and you may not be able to avoid at all so that your avoiding dysfunction will grow from the placement of the sling. So it's a patient to, time to counsel the patient about how to avoid doing valsalva avoiding. The other option is that, you know, in the face of a complication, you went into the operating room, you did a sling, and now you don't understand why they're not voiding. Is the sling too tight? Is it obstructive? Did something happen to the bladder over time? Um, and there's no longer a bladder muscle function um, and detrus are under activity. So the, the, the reliability and the diagnostic piece of urodynamics is very valuable from that perspective. And it'll also potentially give you some malpractice mitigation if you can go back and find some of those pre-existing issues. Next slide. So just a kind of a snapshot of urodynamics from an industry perspective. You know, when I started in 2003 as an attending, um, there were lots of choices in urodynamics and we had a lot of options to choose from, but just like anything over time, things have changed. And we're seeing that there's um, Labrie in 2012 was acquired by Audax, a private equity platform. Um, they went and consolidated over the, the um, over several years, four years, and bought out 14 different companies that were providing urodynamic services. They then merged in 2014 with TDOT, and in 2016, they sold to um, an even larger private equity platform, the Patricia Fund. Um, by 2019, TDOC came off of um, its patent, and we started to see a huge rise in the price and the cost of our consumables. It was outrageous, the 130% increase um, since 2019 in, after the patent came off and in preparation for competition, I assume. Um, and that just kind of left us with vulnerability to price hikes and one-sided manufacturing relationship that minimized innovation over time and they just weren't attentive with customer service so you see all the problems that come with monopolies go ahead and next slide so what what's in a bully monopoly mentality well they're forcing loyalty rather than earning it and i was experiencing this every day in my practice it was so frustrating you know did you did you guys see your aerodynamics rep from 2016 to 2022 in my practice, you know, we would really have to search them out. They, they knew they had our business. They knew we didn't have alternate choices. And we'd have to really look for them. We'd wait forever on customer calls. There were stock outages, more and more catheters were failing. So it was just a frustrating time. Again, we saw those price hikes up to 130% and they were bundling um, all the different options that they had and they said look you know if you, you have to buy more of everything that we have in order to get better pricing and not have to pay more 
Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna charge you extra. It felt like. Um, and then they, I literally had a group come in of Lavery representatives into my practice. They sat in front of me at a point where I was switching from Lavery's PTNS because I had the largest PTNS program in South or in Florida actually, and um, we were switching over to the Medtronic's um, service line. And they were sitting in front of me and talking to me. We had we had had a bid for a Eurodynamics machine. They were talking about how that pricing was no longer going to apply if we left the PTNS market. And that they, you know, I had one of the reps saying how it was his livelihood and how could that happen. So there was a lot of issues going around this, this bundling idea and how we needed to um, jump on board with that in order to get reasonable prices. Next slide. The RFID barcode scanner lockout, I mean, did I, in my practice, we, you know, we got offered a free upgrade. Free upgrade of what? Some quality to the Eurodynamics machine, some innovative technology? No, an upgrade that locked out the ability to use other consumables. In, um, I think, response to being off patent and having competition. And then we were told that you have a mandatory upgrade. And then lastly now, did you know that every single machine now has that RFID lockout on it? and you can't get it turned off. So, you know, and then, you know, we waited for a machine that took 18 to 24 months for delivery. We were told that if, you know, they had machines that were already built that hardly had the RFID on it, and that if you bought a machine um, that was from that stock that they already had, that um, it would take less time to get the machine and they could just turn off the RFID. Well, it took forever to get the machine. And then when it came, they refused to turn the RFID off. Um, and later down the road, I got a letter um, from Lavery that said, hey, you know, your warranty is going to be null and void if you're using third party products because we can't we can't um, service those items. They might injure your machine. And even more aggressive than that, they've actually sent out now contracts to the patients that says, OK, look, if you really want your RFID removed, we'll remove it. But next slide. We want you to sign a contract that says you recognize that your warranty is no longer going to be valid. So, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, it does makes no sense that having pump tubing on a lavatory machine, which all it does is run over the rollers for the pump and hook onto an, the catheter piece. It, it makes no sense that that ha would have any effect on the warranty. It makes no sense that a catheter hooked to, to an external cable and placed in a patient would have any effect on the machine itself. So I'm sure that all of you are aware that these are just tactics that they're working on to try to prevent us. So these, all of these frustrations that I had in my practice and over the years is what has culminated into um, Gemini Medical Technologies, which is what we're here about today. Next slide. Um, so introducing Atmos, you know, we just want you to know that we are backwards compatible. You can hook in and play. You don't necessarily even have to recalibrate your machine. Although, you know, I recalibrate periodically, check the machine anyway. Um, the Eurodynamics warranty, um, the Federal Trade Commission can protects and you can look up that information as well. They'll protect you from those kind of um, uh, claims and I would I would watch signing some kind of a contract that gave up my warranty. Um, as well, you know, we're going to be here to provide supply and work on um, upgrading your equipment. If they're talking about upgrades with you, we want you to just be aware that you may get that barcode replaced on your machine or you will. Next slide. Brian. <clears throat> Hello. So um, thank you, Dr. Babin. So when we were building Gemini from the ground up over the past many years, we took feedback from Dr. Babin and the rest of the market. And essentially, we realized that we wanted to do everything the opposite of what had happened since 2019 and even before that Dr. Babin just spoke about. Um, we really wanted to have compassion and we partnered with practices, which means great customer service. We wanted to pro provide innovative and premium products um, not just me too products, not not um, cheap products, 
And then we wanted to provide responsible value-based pricing um, as opposed to egregious price hikes or even coming into the market at the price points that our competitor had raised the market to, which as Dr. Babin just said, had raised 130% more than doubling the price over just the past few years. So those are our core values, which is partnering with practices to provide innovative premium products with responsible and value-based pricing. We have two sides to our business. We have our uh, MMT equipment line, which we'll talk about. And we also, which we'll start with now, have our consumable line, which we brand Atmos. So everyone thought we were just a copycat catheter, but quite frankly, we're not. The Atmos catheters, we, did, we really had three main objectives in mind when we were creating them, and we wanted them to be a better catheter. The first one was patient comfort. Uh, the second one was no retraining or no change in workflow for the practitioner. And third, and what seems to be one of the most important ones, was increasing the practice's bottom line. So how do we make it more comfortable for the patient? Well, well first of all, um, the competitor is marketed as a seven French catheter, but it's it's actually an eight French catheter, it's 7.8 French. Um, Atmos catheters are a true six French catheter. And if you hold up an Atmos catheter and the competitor catheter, you can visually see how much thinner it is. So we did that for more patient comfort, especially going into the urethra. The second thing is we completely changed the materials on it. So we made it from a, medical grade polyurethane material both the catheter and the balloon that actually is pretty rigid going in so it can be inserted easily however at body temperature that material will soften up a little bit so it doesn't feel necessarily like there's such a firm rigid catheter going through the urethra and then um we didn't want there to be any change in workflow or retraining so we made our catheter lures be the same colors we made sure that it would uh, match up with existing cables on all legacy equipment in the market that did not have any sort of lockout or was uh, air charge catheter technology. And then what we did was we did a study with almost 2,000 data points. It was powered at 151 catheters. And over the entire urodynamics pressure spectrum, where you would see during a study, we took machines that we um, calibrated to the competitor's catheter, not our own catheter, and then we checked it at points all the way up. And then we sent it to a third party um, statistician to review and the results were nothing short of stellar. And we did that and it actually delayed our launch to get to this incredible accomplishment because we didn't want the field, the customers to have to recalibrate to our catheter to try out the product, then recalibrate back to the competitor's catheter to finish up their inventory and then recalibrate back to us again. So. When many of our customers come on board for our urodynamics catheters, they maybe are out of just one of the SKUs that they use. And as everyone knows, there's two catheters for every study. So in some patients, they're using one catheter from us and one from the competition until they finish burning up all of their old inventory. And then they're using only our product. And then the bottom line we had talked about. So this is just a quick summary. We talked about patient comfort. We talked about backwards compatibility. Um, we realized that there had been these egregious price increases. So we came to market last year at 35% less expensive than the competition who had by this point, including some of the largest groups in the country, the private equity groups had raised them to full list price. Um, we came in at 35% lower and we agreed not to raise prices for at least, at least three years. And that's in writing for every one of our customers. So we did not do a price increase in January of this year. And we're not doing a price increase in January of next year. Um, the beginning of this year, our competitor did another 15% price increase. So now we're over 40% less expensive um, than the competition. Not cheap. These are European high quality made catheters, but less expensive. We wanted to bring the pricing back to where it should be and not just be a, a greedy uh, company. On the equipment side, we brought a lot of innovation as well. So um, our our equipment partner is MMT MedConsult. They're also a European company. They are new to the United States via Gemini, but they've been in the industry for over 40 years. And we helped them with their fourth generation line of urodynamics equipment, which we launched last year at Augs IUGA in Austin, Texas. And we spent a tremendous amount of time, and Dr. Babin spent a tremendous amount of time assisting us to make sure that the user experience was not just a copycat, another urodynamics system. Um, without going into too much detail, it's 
it's very intuitive to use. It's clean. It's easy. It, it makes it easier to make sure there's good quality studies. It even has reminders when it's time to do a cough and a Valsalva. Um, one of the most important things we were able to accomplish was integrated EMR capability and compatibility with from our lowest level system to our top of the line system. And, you know, that's something that's escaped the market for for ever up until now. And then we actually went to a third party um, consulting firm and they validated us on the six major um, EMR platforms that it works perfectly, both using HL7 protocols or DICOM protocols. The next thing we want to do was change just the whole workflow and make it cleaner and easier. You know, currently, most of you or all of you are doing a urodynamic study, then you're printing it off, then someone's doing some, some notes, maybe doing some calculations, then they're scanning it, and then you're uploading it to the EMR. So what we were able to accomplish was really the first ever um, almost auto interpretation. What we've done here with Dr. Babin's help was following ICS guidelines at the end of the study, when you go to the reporting module, and this is included in all of our software, if someone chooses to use it, it will guide the person doing the interpretation through each part of the study where they'll see the numbers, they'll see the markings, and then there's preloaded um, text um, that they can choose from, or you can add freeform text if that's what you normally use. So within about two minutes with it guiding you through the, the study and creating the report, there will be pre-populated paragraphs with the right wording that pull in the statistic, the numbers. And as well, at the end, it will give a place for the diagnosis and the treatment plan. It also brings in all of the patient information, including um, who the referring physician was, who did the study, who did the interpretation, and who was the supervising physician. The reason this is so revolutionary is, based on what I just told you, you're going to take this smart report, if you choose to, and then you're going to load it straight into the EMR. So it becomes paperless. So instead of taking all that time and having it pile up, it becomes paperless. And the other nice thing is if the physician wants to review the study and do the report themselves on a second on their computer in their office, all you, all you have to do is email and export. They upload it to their version of the software, which there's no extra charge for, and they can still on their computer move the lines around and the markings around and add to it if they see someone missed a, a peak, let's just say on a mark. So we've really changed the way it's done the interpreter doesn't have to go to the computer if they don't want the uh, system if they don't want and we've made this paperless the next thing we said is you know as dr babin said she waited over 18 months for a system when her hospital bought the system so we wanted to change the way that's done and we also wanted to, to reduce the complexity of purchasing a system and provide fast turnaround so we created four different out-of-the-box systems which we'll talk about in just a minute that are very unique and they're very, we design them so that there's the right system for each practice and we can very quickly and easily help tell a customer which is the right system for them. We are able to um, give remote software and reporting demonstrations so we don't have to wait for someone to come into your office and schedule it. We can work around the office's schedule for them to work with our, clin our clinical experts to, to see the software and see this um, new type of reporting package that we talked about by a remote um, like we're doing today. As far as quoting goes, I know that quotes from our com competitor can be four or five pages long and very confusing. Simple one page quote, and we do it on the screen right in front of our customers with um, all the pricing showing. So it's open face quoting. So it makes it super easy. And then we do have financing available. So what does this mean for the customer? It means that we can work quickly with you to help identify the system that's right for you. We can let you see what the uh, user experience is going to be like. We can quote you real time right there so you can see what the costs are and any upgrades you might want to see are. And because we're building to these four configurations, constantly building to these four configurations in the right quantities, we have, we have systems in our warehouse already built and ready to go. In fact, we're expanding our clinical team because at this point, the market has taken to us so greatly that our biggest bottleneck is literally having enough clinical people to go in and do the um, installation and training. Okay, busy slide, but uh, it'll be just a few quick points on it. So starting on the left, we have our video system. This is only going to probably be used by teaching institutions or uh, practices that do video urodynamics. If that's not you, 
that's not the right product for you. Then we have what we call the Symphony ML. That's a highly upgraded system that has the ability to do more upgrades. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. Then we have the Symphony EL, and this has been a bestseller. What we realized was that the market had a big gap from a laptop-based system, which most, and I'll talk more about this as well, most practices and people that do your dynamics do not wanna work off a laptop Ivy Bolt based system. But the competitor went from that being in the $20,000, $25,000 range straight to a system that was sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars 70000 and up. What we've done is we've been able to bring to market an entry-level cart-based system with a long warranty. So it fills a gap in the market. And we're seeing that that system is selling over the laptop system two and three times to one. So the market really did need an affordable cart-based system, which is what they wanted. Now, going back to the Symphony ML and the Symphony SC, we talked earlier about innovation. So I want to just hit on innovation for a minute. Uh, two, two things that are available on our systems that no one else has. The first is a leak point camera. Um, for those of you who do your dynamics, when it's time for the leak, you put your face down, your head down where you're looking for the leak, and then you got to get back up to mark the leak. It's not that necessarily that fun, and it's also hard to mark the leak. With this leak point camera, which is it looks like an endoscopy scope that is aimed for the leak, it shows picture in picture with the tracings, and it's running real time and linked with the tracings. So you're looking at your screen, you're seeing and looking for the leak, and when you see the leak, you mark it on the screen. And if you miss it, you can rewind the video just a little bit, and it will rewind the tracings so that they're because they're working together, so you, that you can perfectly mark the leak. Similarly, we have another innovative product. So when it comes time for your post void residual at the end, your PVR, we have an integrated bladder scanner option. And both of those come standard on our video urodynamic system. So it's a high quality um, integrated bladder scanner for the PVR. Now, Dr. Babin will do her first case study. So I'm very passionate about education. Um, I've been teaching in the fellowship training programs for many years. I've taught courses all over the world, including six continents. Um, so you know, one of the things that I wanna help provide as we move forward is education and making sure that we're not only providing, you know, some that we're getting quality studies from our patients. So I just wanted to, you know, take an opportunity to go over a couple of um, case presentations with you. JS is a 72-year-old male. He has a history of spinal stenosis and bladder um, pros uh, um, benign prostatic hypertrophy. He had one previous TERP. He complains that his stream is slow and intermittent. He's voiding every one to two hours, and he's feeling though he's maybe not emptying all the way. He just voids a little bit at a time. He experienced a sudden urgency, and now he's complaining that he leaks often um, before he gets to the toilet. On exam, he's a slightly enlarged prostate. So, you know, you're starting to think to yourself, what's going on? Is the, is the prostate contributing to this phenomenon? Is the spinal stenosis contributing to the, the phenomenon? And, you know, sometimes patients confuse a feeling of, and it happens all the time, they come in, they say, I'm not emptying my bladder well. And you find that their residuals are fine. There's no problem there. But what they're interpreting as a feeling of incomplete emptying is really overactive bladder spasms, where they're going very, very frequently, and there's just not much urine there to void. Next slide. Um, so this kind of just gives you is a picture of his urodynamic study. Um, and when you start out, if you look, I wish I had a pointer. Um, if you kind of, we have the the, let me just orient you first off to the to the um, channels. The PDET is on top, so that's our subtracted value. Um, and then you have your vest, the bladder pressure and the abdominal pressure, the um, flow, the volume infused, the, and I'm sorry, the flow pressure, and then the, fl the flow from the bladder, the EMG, and then the infused volume. So, um, what I like to do when I start looking at a study is just kind of overall look, are all the channels recording properly? I usually ask for my staff to show me a cough test in the beginning so I can look at what those pressures are. I don't actually see that on this study, but you'd like to see a spike that's, that's equal in transmission on both your bladder catheter and your abdominal catheter. You'd like to see that your baseline pressure is starting out good. I like for my detrusor baseline pressure to be less than five. Um, and then as you kind of go through this um, study, 
you can start to see there's a lot of wiggle and wobble in that detrusor line. So um, this patient, if you look at each of those, you'll start to see where he's rec they're recording urgency and even urgency leak. Um, so um, next slide for JS um, is just this. I wanted to give you an overall impression of what one of our reports would look like for a study. So you would get a summary um, page that kind of just gives you the overall picture of the actual study. Next page. Um, and then you get your, we break it into the billing components. So the, the leak point pressures are shown there. You have a summary of the events as we move down. Next page. And then you'll notice something different here. We have a leak point pressure um, result section where it's doing a calculated leak point pressure. It's taking into account your detrusor baseline pressure and subtracting that out for you. Um, this particular patient doesn't have stress incontinence, so it doesn't show any of that data, but you can see that if it did, you would have a McGuire result that would talk to intrinsic sphincter deficiency or hypermobility, and it would actually report those values there as that intrinsic sphincter deficiency or hypermobility. Um, you can add your professional interpretation inputs there. That was the part that Brian was talking about, where you can click on and fill in any interpretation that you have about your leak point pressures at the moment of the study. Next. Um, this is just the filling part of the um, systometry, and it talks to the baseline pressure. You know, you can talk about your sensations, if they were premature, if they were normal, how much was it limited by the detrusor overactivity, and then it looks at the, uh, the compliance and uses the GOM curve to tell you and help you determine if that is a normal or an abnormally compliant bladder. Next. Um, in the voiding phase, you know, you, you get an overall snippet from the voiding phase, and then it will go into um, the flow portion and give you the interpretation there. It will then go into the more complex recordings um, and um, give you interpretation there. And then next, it then it reads an EMG and it gives some interpretation. So that's innovative for our products. It will help you looking at the EMG if you can see um, what kind of activity you have. It will help you decide if your guarding reflex is present, if your voiding reflex is present, where the urethra relaxes before the bladder contracts, and it will help you with the activity and if valsalva voiding is present or absent. It also in the nomogram section is set to be um, smart from entries at the at the beginning. So if you're entering the ages and the sex of the patient, it will then be able to choose graphs and nomograms that apply to your patient in particular. Um, and then it will automatically report those graphs for you. Currently in the um, in the competitive systems, you really are set with what nomograms you have. So for example, if you're if you're um, a urogynecologist and you're looking for the Blavis um, uh, study or the Solomon Greenwell, you don't have those options where in this particular um, software you do. Next. Next. That's just a list of the events. So in this patient, an older gentleman, we were seeing lots of detrusor overactivity going through the graft um, and we he avoided fine. There was no obstruction. The compliance was normal. So in that patient, you know, had you not had your urodynamic study, you may have been questioning whether he needed a repeat surgical intervention with a TERP because he has slightly enlarged bladder. Was he, was he having problems with his compliance? Was he having problem emptying the bladder? So, um, you know, that just gives us a great uh, representation. Next case, we're going to move a little bit quickly because I don't want us to run out of time for questions. Um, this is a 39-year-old female patient with Alport syndrome complaining of going to the restroom every hour. She has urgency most of the time for the last 15 years. She's not often leaking, either stress-related or urge-related. She does no pain, and, but she developed a little post-void dribble after her, the birth of her second child six months ago, and she did pelvic floor physical therapy with no relief. On exam, she has no prolapse. She has a negative um, stress test. Her residual is normal. Uh, 
borderline actually i mean i think there's debate regarding that so it's a little bit high it's on the upper end and her urinalysis is negative her cystoscopy is normal next so if you just take this as a snippet from the graph um, just as a case study in general um, you can see you can't actually i didn't show you her euroflow but her euroflow was normal her Qmax was 26 um, and her PBR turned out to be 50. So it was representative of for her a normal void. And then we did her filling cystometry. She had a great baseline detrusor pressure. Her sensations were completely normal. She made it to a capacity of 563 mLs. The detrusor um, muscle itself in PDET is nice and stable. There's no overactivity of the um, muscle of the bladder. If you were wondering, does she have overactivity, right? We didn't see any, and you may have been asking yourself, does she have interstitial cystitis? The fact that she made it to a capacity of 563 mLs with not much discomfort kind of goes against the idea that she has something called interstitial cystitis. So, um, you know, we were able to do provocative maneuvers. We still didn't institute any overactive bladder. Her compliance was normal. and I just want to bring your attention to in in Eurogyne, we use dual sensor catheters, and this is dual sensor. You um, can look at the P Eura, and you can start to see that that graph is overlapping to the next level. So it's bypassing its border. She has very high pressures, and you can see a lot of fluctuation just back to back to back to back to back on that graph. And this this graph would normally look like you're looking at the vesicle pressure only elevated because it's in the urethra and you want to have a little bit of pressure in the urethra but it shouldn't be doing this wobbling effect and that is what we call urethra instability and she also has hypertension because it's over 120 centimeters of water pressure in fact it's 180 it's a very high pressure um she did not have any stress incontinence the urethral pressure profile showed a normal, uh, well, that, that elevated urethral pressure with a normal continent zone. It didn't, it changed slightly with the stress um, reading, uh, but she definitely did not have intrinsic sphincter deficiency. And then whenever she was able to void, we were able to see that her closure pressure did come down despite the fact that the urethra is very high. Her cl closure pressure was able to come down just before her detrusor contraction so that she wasn't having any detrusor sphincter dysinertia and then creating risk potentially for upper tract injury. So her flow rate was good. She was able to empty her bladder and it, um, by her nomograms, um, and calculations that we, we have to hand calculate with the competitive software. She was unobstructed and her contractility was normal. And it, we always report if they're having an abnormal, whether it's neurogenic or non-neurogenic. Um, but in this case, it was just normal. And then if you look at her EMG, you can see that she does have um, a desire, uh, the, the EMG activity increasing as you approach the voiding. So you can see it relax just prior to void. And then you'll start to see the activity coming back um, where in the, um, um, when she's voiding in and of itself. The activity is somewhat paroxysmal and she does have some pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, overall, this patient, um, in a lot of cases without the urodynamics test would have been diagnosed with um, an overactive bladder. She would have, you know, she went for physical therapy and failed that. She would have gone through trials of medications, potentially in her, um, invasive therapy such as Botox. But with these findings, we're able to say, okay, she doesn't look like she has, or even potentially diagnosed with interstitial cystitis. It doesn't look like she has interstitial cystitis. So when we know that the urethra is this wobbly and unstable, we can um, get results by giving them medications like Flomax or Rapaflow. Oftentimes that will calm things down enough that they're then able to space their voiding out and they will many times respond better to physical therapy once you've identified these items. They also have some data that sacral nerve modulation can help them. Um, so this is a this is a study wherein um, urodynamics would definitely help you take better care of your patient. Next slide. I'm just going to jump over this to the next slide for Brian. All right. All right. So thank you. Um, I have two quick case studies from an ROI perspective. 
And the first one is we're going to talk about equipment just a little bit. And I wanted you to see that with our product line, uh, we're competitively priced with a lot more bells and whistles, about 35% less expensive and then than the competition. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're selling two to three times more of the Symphony ELs than the Melody, which is the laptop IV pole system, because the market really did want a cart-based system, but it just wasn't affordable with the competition with most, most practices. So I like to say that this first case study is, you know, how long do you want to wait to buy a piece of equipment if your equipment is aging or if you can't get consumables for it anymore? I know a lot of people with the Cooper systems have been having trouble getting consumables. And so starting with buying the new system, you have to look at how much time will it take to repay that system or what's the value cost of it. So first we start off with what's the cost of our consumables versus the competition at the top and then what's the cost for a typical study. When you look at what the consumable cost for a typical study is with competitors, it's about $190 per study. When you look at it with our consumables, it's about 110. That's almost an $80 savings per study. So what that means is if the national average for reimbursement for your dynamic study is about $620. Here in Florida, it's 625. In New York, it's in the 700s. In other places, it's maybe say 580. So using the national average, what I wanted to do here was show how profitable your dynamics can be while giving better patient outcomes that Dr. Babin's been speaking about. So you have about $510 of margin for every your dynamic study, not including the soft costs like the nurse's time, or the, the your dynamicist time or the overhead of the room that's being used. But quite simply, for every single month that a typical practice may be doing 30 studies per month, which is an average practice that has not been bought up by private equity, it would be multiple of that. Um, you're looking at about 16, 15, 16 thousand dollars per month your practice is missing out on, as well as the potential um, treatment pathway. So it's normally going to be, unless you're buying a video system, three months or less to pay off a system from your margin from your Eurodynamic study. That's the important uh, takeaway from this first case study. If a practice is stumbling or they don't want to pay twenty or thirty thousand dollars for a piece of equipment, you should pay it off in under two or three months, um, just based on the the margin you get from doing Eurodynamic studies. The second study, this is a true case study that we've done with a customer. This is a busy slide, and um, like Dr. Babin said, I wish I had a pointer, but I'll go through it pretty quickly with you, and then we'll do a summary. This was a practice that does 120 patients for diagnos diagnosis with urinary incontinence every single month. They were using 75% Eurocuff, 25% Eurodynamics. They were also missing a major Eurodynamics code for the abdominal catheter um, when we looked at what they were doing. Um, and so what happened here was, both of the case studies Dr. Babin showed today, Eurocuff would not have been a good diagnostic tool. For the male patient, it would not have found what Dr. Babin found with a full year dynamic study. Maybe there's a place for it, but overall, you get significantly more information from your dynamics. And obviously, for those of you who know Eurocuff, it does not work on females. So um, Dr. Babin's practice is a urogynecologist. Nobody could use Eurocuff. So what we did was we educated this practice on moving everybody over to your dynamics. Um, we educated them on the billing code. And going back to the prior slide, they were having $154,000 a year of total consumable cost between the Euro cuffs and the Euro dynamic supplies with 150 ish of margin. And then after only a few thousand dollars more of consumables, we're going to 100% Euro dynamics. And with the extra reimbursement codes and the lower price point of our your dynamic consumables, they ended up going up to $740,000 of margin. So what does this mean? This is just a quick summary of what happened. So uh, the your dynamics reimbursement went up by almost $200 by using proper billing code. Their overall reimbursement from changing the mix from 75% Eurocuff and 25% Eurodynamics to 100% Eurodynamics, the reimbursement went up by over $410. Their consumable costs on their Eurodynamics went down by $80. Their total study consumable cost only went up by 
three dollars. So therefore, for every study that was done or every diagnostics on all of the 400, I'm sorry, the 120 patients per month, we've actually incremented the practice by $410 approximately per study, netting just under $600,000 for that practice in incremental um, profit on the same flow through of patients at 120 patients per month. So I went through that very quickly. Hopefully you learned from it, but we wanted to give a little bit of time for Q&A and thank you for your time. Questions? All right. Hey, thanks. That was very good. Um, just if you have any questions, please put them into our comment box. Uh, panelists, if you have any questions, we'll go ahead and let you guys lead off. I have one quick question for your uh, doc, probably Dr. Elizabeth. Um, the professional report that I saw written on the study, was that generated by the computer or is that something that you then interpreted? For the first case study, that, that is the report that's generated by our system. That's nice. Yeah, that's auto generate, generated. It auto generates results. Um, you'll basically be able to just look at the boxes. There's no hand calculating. Everything's all set for you. Very good. I, I have a comment. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. It was great. Um, so I, this literally just happened on Thursday. And we um, had a patient come in for your dynamic the barcode on the abdominal catheter didn't work for whatever reason. And the rest of the catheters that we had all had barcodes that weren't used for one reason or another. We scanned the barcode code, but we didn't end up using it. We ended up having to cancel the patient. They went, we transferred them over to our Winfield office, who has a brand new urodynamic system, same company, who ended up having the same patient had an air warning on the, the um, computer and the water pump had to be serviced. So this poor guy, and this is all because of a barcode, you know, I had to send, you know, the, the, the barcodes that weren't in use to the company just to get to have them send us barcodes. And how do you tell a patient, we can't do your urodynamic study because we can't get any further because we can't scan this barcode. I mean, it's awful. Can I make yeah, a comment? Yes. Uh, so I run this Facebook group called the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. A simple search for the term library will yield no shortage of absolute hate, hate comments from users of the library system, from price gouging, from locking users, from using other catheters by using this RFID and the barcode system. I can't tell you how much hate mail, how much hate comment that, that I read regarding the use of library systems. And I've also got read comments who have made favorable responses to the use of Gemini MedTech cat their your Atmos catheters. I'm also going to mention your one of the competitors in your dynamic space, that's Prometheus. Some users, some uh, members have mentioned that they also had good luck with the Prometheus system. I believe they use water charge catheters and not air charge. I, I love how Gemini Medical is so empathetic to the end user. And thank you. Keep up the great work. And I do not work for Gemini MedTech. I have no financial interest in Gemini MedTech. Back to you, Rick. Yeah. yeah. As somebody who does a lot of your dynamics, and, and I started out with water charge when the air charge catheters came in, it was such a game changer. It made it, uh, you know, save my time, which is important. It gave very accurate studies, some of the problems that we were having. And actually the reason Gemini is on is I was invited because I was griping about the fact that we're paying so much for these air charge catheters. And I kind of made the statement, well, you don't have any choice. And that's when John told me, hey, wait a second, there is. So I thought this is important news to bring to our, our audience that there are options out there. And I think it's, uh, um, I also worked with equipment that had those RFID readers. And when they fail, everything fails. So I, I would like to see those things avoided completely. Um, and that's my comment. We are running close to the end of our show. Uh, I don't think there's any questions that came in. So we must have answered everybody in the audience's thoughts during the talk. <laughs> Any other comments from any of our audience, uh, our experts? Otherwise, I just wanted I'm to thank go. you. Yeah. 
Go thank ahead. you for the presentation today. And then thank you for taking into consideration the environmental impact of Eurodynamics and reducing all of those paper, printing it out, and maybe you lose it. And then you print it out again, and then you write on it, and then you print it out again. And now we're wasting all of this paper. So thank you for cons considering that. Yeah, absolutely. That's another big point. Okay, folks. Well, we're going to call it a meeting here. So let me just tune over to my next. Oops, let's see. I got to always hit the wrong button. I got to bring myself into. Hi again. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Into next week's program. So a uh, little plug for next week's. The i tin device consists of a series of interlocking nitinol coils that are implanted within the prostatic urethra. Once in place, i tin gently compresses the prostate tissue. This relieves the urinary obstruction and discomfort associated with BPH. What makes i tin particularly appealing is its temporary nature. It can be removed after a few days, allowing patients to return to their normal activities quickly. Check out episode 61 to learn more on Euronurse.com. Hey, just a quick programming note for next week and next week's only. We are going to be starting at 8 o'clock Central Time. Uh, there was an issue that we had to work to get work through, and that was our best solution was just to start the program early. So we will be starting it a little bit early next week um, at 8 a.m. Central Time. Sorry for you people out on the Pacific Coast. Um, but that's uh, our show. I'd like to thank our guests for this uh, great presentation and, of course, all of our experts. And, hey, I got a plane to catch to go to Denver, so I'm going to be heading out myself. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.